Welcome. Welcome to Go Green Wilmette's fourth webinar of 2022, Beneficial Bugs, featuring insect experts from the Peggy Notabert Nature Museum in Chicago and the North Shore Mosquito Abatement District. I am Catherine Calkins, Go Green Wilmette board member. Uh, I wanted to create the webinar tonight because I realized that many people living here in our beautiful suburbs might not understand or fully appreciate insects. We probably know that bees and butterflies are important, but we don't realize the amazing different kinds of insects that can live here in suburban Chicago if they meet with the right conditions. The diversity of insects is not only fun and fascinating, it's also vital because it supports a healthy ecosystem which supports our health and keeps our area resilient as, climates con as our climate continues to change. At the same time, I know that families are rightly concerned about mosquitoes which do carry disease and do represent a public health risk. People don't wanna encounter mosquitoes in their yards and this concern can override any desire they might have to attract other insects. Um, I'm hoping that with our two speakers uh, tonight, we can find a balance between creating a nature friendly space that provides homes for beneficial insects while minimizing mosquitoes with some common sense techniques that work well. Our speakers tonight are scientists who focus on insects in different ways. Our first speaker, Doug Tarrin, is chief curator of the Peggy Notabert Nature Museum. He earned his PhD from Northwestern University. He conducts butterfly conservation research and education, and he has been involved with habitat restoration in Illinois almost since he moved here in the 1980s. Our second speaker, Mark Clifton, is executive director of the North Shore Mosquito Abatement District. He has a PhD from Florida International University and came to Illinois from the Collier Mosquito Control District in Naples, Florida. Mark also chairs the Endangered Species Act subcommittee for the board of the American Mosquito Control Association. This subcommittee addresses pollinator protection and endangered species issues for the association. So Doug will be our first speaker. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak tonight and please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, I am going to go ahead and share my screen here so we can get started. There we go. So um, I uh, was asked to talk about bugs in backyards this evening, and, and so uh, that is that is uh, the nature of what we are going to be discussing today. And many people wonder why they should um, want a lot of different kinds of bugs in their yard anyway. And insects, if you think of any particular role that an organism can serve in an ecosystem, predators, prey, herbivores, anything like that, somewhere there is going to be some insect serving that role. Um, they're well known as pollinators, but they're also decomposers. Um, they they um, uh, participate in seed dis distribution. There, there really is uh, just a huge array of ecological functions that insects serve. Many of them are also very beautiful, and that's another reason to want them in your yard in your yard. And I would also, uh, I frequently ask, uh, get asked, uh, say when I'm doing butterfly conservation work or something along those lines, what good is it? What, what does it do? Beyond all of these roles that insects play, uh, it does raise the question, are things that human people consider useful, the only important considerations um, in ecology? And I think biological diversity uh, is is um, a benefit in and of itself. And if you are concerned with biological diversity, and if that's something you want to uh, help to preserve and maintain, then insects are definitely imp an important part of that. When a lot of people think about conservation, they think about you know tigers and redwood trees and that sort of thing. The vertebrates, most of the animal species that people think about in terms of conservation are represented by the blue slice on this pie chart. There are only 3% of the species diversity on the planet. 
In contrast, insects are about 40% of the species diversity on the planet. They're re represented in orange in this pie chart. Plants are the gray, and then everything else, all of the sponges and mollusks and crustaceans and um, all of the other groups are represented by the yellow slice of the pie. So insects contribute an enormous amount to the biological diversity on the planet. When people think of insects, a lot of people immediately sort of gravitate towards pest species. But as we can see here, pest species, the species that people are worried about um, uh, under the, but won't they eat my petunias heading, are a tiny minority of the species. Only about 2% of insect species um, have been recognized as pests. Now, it's important to consider that when we speak about pest spe species, we're talking about agricultural pests, we're talking about pests of stored food, we're talking about um, things like mosquitoes, ectoparasites, that sort of thing. Um, but we're also talking about um, any plant, any insect species uh, that eats plants has been considered by the Department of Agriculture to be a pest species. That's how they define it. So under certain definitions, things like monarch butterflies are classified as plant pest species. So definitions are really important here, but it's, it's also important to bear in mind that most species of insects are not in fact pests. Pests can also be in the eye of the beholder. This is a beetle that I see in my yard most summers. Um, uh, it's a fairly large beetle. This is over an inch in length. And they're very, very beautiful, those shiny wing, um, wing covers and the exoskeleton uh, in that shiny brown uh, makes this beetle look like it's made out of burnished wood. Uh, now, this is the grapevine polydnata. And this is a uh, species that sometimes does affect crops. Uh, the grubs eat grapes. But uh, particularly here in northern Illinois, the vast majority of this particular species is feeding on wild grapes and um, lives in a fairly balanced condition with its ecosystem. The uh, wild grapes are doing extremely well in um, northern Illinois. And um, in some situations in restoration programs, they're actually um, controlled as part of um, uh, woody brush control. So when you think about insect habitat, uh, you might think about the main categories to things that insects are going to need in your backyard, food, water, and shelter. But in keeping with the complexity of uh, insect diversity and role, the picture is actually a lot more comp complex than this. Consider food, for example. Insects frequently have very complex life cycles. So, um, uh, for example, the uh, black swallowtail butterfly, uh, in keeping with all butterflies, uh, undergoes metamorphosis and the young stages, the caterpillars, not only look very different from the adults, but they have completely different diets than the adults. Uh, so for example, with the black swallowtail, the caterpillars feed exclusively on the leaves of plants in the carrot family. Uh, this includes things like fennel, dill, parsley. In the wild, Queen Anne's lace is really what's carrying the species predominantly here in northern Illinois. But these are the caterpillars that you'll see on the dill and the fennel in your herb garden. In contrast, the adults take nectar on uh, a wide diversity of flower types. And generally, adult butterflies are not terribly specific about what species of plants that they take nectar from. As long as the floral tube is short enough that the butterfly can get its proboscis down into the nectar reserve, and as long as this is a species of plant that produces reasonably abundant nectar, butterflies will use it. So food immediately splits into what do the larvae or the uh, 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 immature stages need and what do the adults need? Water, similarly, um, can, can be um, uh, partitioned into different types of needs. 
Um, does the insect live in water for all or part of its lifespan? Or do they, are they merely drinking or imbibing the water? So you get things like dragonflies and damselflies. They actually begin their lives uh, as aquatic insects. Um, other species are going to need to um, drink water. Most um, insects that don't live in water are getting their water either from the plants that they feed on or they're drinking from moist soil as this um, uh, uh, southern dog face butterfly here is, or uh, they are um, uh, also drinking from uh, dew that forms uh, in the morning on plants. Um, the dragonfly here, by the way, is an autumn meadow hawk. Uh, this is one of the dragonflies that, as their nam name implies, they fly later in the summer. And they um, are one of the species that uh, fairly frequently show up in people's yards. So we can divide water up, but when you get to shelter, that's where things really divide up into a lot of subcategories because as I said, insects perform many roles and just about everything that they do, they're going to need a specific spot to do that in. So for example, um, insects that undergo a pupation phase, the larvae and the adults may live in different places. They frequently eat different things. When the caterpillar goes to pupate, it typically wanders away from its host plant and maybe in yet a third type of place. It typically needs some sort of a surface to crawl onto to create its pupa. So um, you have that. Uh, foraging, and this is gonna vary widely depending on the type of insect that you're talking about. So the pollinators, the bees, a lot of the flies, that sort of thing are going to need floral resources for foraging. Hunters like dragonflies and damselflies are going to need a, uh, sources of prey. Um, things that eat detritus are going to need things like leaf litter. So um, you're going to have a lot of different, depending on the specifics of the species that you're talking about, you're going to have uh, a lot of different um, specific needs along those lines. Um, mating and territoriality is yet another set of needs that insects uh, require. And um, I'm, I'm using a firefly to illustrate this. Uh, firefly uh, ba uh, suburban backyards can be excellent habitat for fireflies. We'll talk a little bit more about them in uh, a couple of minutes here. But all of that light display, the aerial flashing and all of that, nearly all of it is about mating. It's about identifying territory and it's the males and the females signaling to each other. And um, there are other types of uh, territorial uh, and um, mating needs that the insects will have as yet another aspect of their habitat. Uh, basking, uh, insects are cold-blooded animals and many species early in the day will need to find a place to warm themselves in the sun to raise their body temperature enough to become active. And even hibernation, and this is yet another very distinct set of habitat needs that uh, many insects have. Now, because the monarch butterfly is so famous and they very famously migrate, a lot of people think that migration is sort of a general trend among insects. In fact, it is very much the exception rather than the rule. Other than monarch butterflies and a few species of dragonflies, the vast majority of insects in this part of the world stay here through the winter. And they will be in one life stage or another hibernating. I have uh, used the morning cloak butterfly to illustrate this because morning cloaks are a bit unusual in that they hibernate as adults. And they manage to not get killed by the winter cold by secreting large amounts of natural antifreezes, things like glycerol and sorbitol into their body fluids. This allows their body temperatures to drop very low without having ice crystals form in their cells. And it's the ice crystals rupturing cells that would actually be what caused cold to kill the insects. 
So you start looking at all of this and you start thinking about your backyard as a habitat for insects. And it all seems like it's getting very complicated very quickly. And in some respects it is because not only is this just a very partial accounting of all of the needs, but the details of what is in all of these circles is going to be different for each species of insects and insect. And as we've already seen, there are a very large number of species of insects. Uh, a lot of people have started trying to um, manage their yards for biodiversity. Many people are doing things like butterfly gardening. And all of this can seem very overwhelming when you first start to do it. And if you are trying to manage your yard for insects, one of the things that I would suggest is to keep your approach simple, particularly if you're doing something like creating a butterfly garden. Uh, there uh, are a lot of uh, books out there about butterfly gardening. Some of them can throw a lot of information at you um, all at once, and it seems like a lot to do. You can get a huge amount of the way to being a good habitat, in particular for butterflies, by concentrating on resources for feeding adults, which in the case of butterflies is going to be ample floral nectar resources. Um, this is a dark form female tiger swallowtail feeding on um, uh, bergamot, monarga fistulosa. In general, you're going to be attracting things that are already in your neighborhood. Um, there, it can be kind of a romantic notion to try to plant some sort of exotic plant to attract a butterfly uh, from um, far away uh, that you might not normally see, but it doesn't really tend to work that way. Um, and I've used this butterfly as an example of this. This is a spice bush swallowtail. This species is very, very rare east, uh, uh, excuse me, west of Lake Michigan in the Chicago area. It's found uh, fairly abundantly in the Indiana dunes and further south and east. But as you get around to this colder side of the lake, this butterfly isn't found very often. And that's because it's um, caterpillar food plant, sassafras, is not found very often. At the Nature Museum, when we first um, opened almost 25 years ago, we planted sassafras on the grounds in the hope that we would attract spice bush swallowtails. After all, they're not found terribly far away from here. In the entire over 20 years that I've been working at the Nature Museum, we have seen exactly one spice bush swallowtail on the museum grounds. It was near the sassafras. Uh, does that make sassafras, our planting of sassafras a success? Well, it did attract the one spice bush swallowtail. In general, I think people are dealing with limited space in their yards, and you might consider giving your space resources over to something that is more likely to turn up for you. You do want to make sure that resources are available throughout the growing season. Uh, we've already had butterflies emerge, um, emerging and being visible on the few warm days that we have had so far this spring. Uh, I have seen morning cloaks, I have seen eastern commas, both of which overwinter as adults. And I've seen um, uh, spring azures, which is this species, which um, overwinter as a chrysalis and they're one of the first chrysalises to emerge in the year. So you wanna have things that go from very early in the spring right into the fall. And early in the spring like this, one of the things that is um, um, a very frequent nectar resource for butterflies are dandelions. So that also um, you know, might affect how you look at certain aspects of yard care. Uh, there are other species that are available this year uh, at this time of year, but none of them really seem to be quite as abundant as dandelions, especially early in the spring. Another thing to consider is that the natural communities in most suburban yards are going to most closely resemble savannas rather than a more open ecosystem like prairies. It is very likely that, very unlikely, I should say, that you're going to be able to att attract prairie specialist butterflies to your yard. A single yard just isn't big enough for that. Uh, there are generally too many trees in most people's neighborhoods. 
Um, and quite understandably, most people don't want to get rid of the trees in their neighborhoods. And so rather than trying to fight nature on this sort of thing, just recognize that it is the savanna species that are ones that are going to be predominating in your yard. And there are plenty of really lovely savanna uh, insects, including butterflies like this question mark butterfly. And I hinted at this with the dandelions, but um, lawn weeds can actually be your friends here. There are a number of butterflies that use common lawn weeds as caterpillar food plants. So this is a red admiral. <clears throat> we should start seeing these very soon. These are one of the earlier spring butterflies. And they um, feed on a variety of plant species, but the one that's really keeping them going in the Chicago area is this really unassuming weed of shady areas and shady lawns called pellitory. It likes disturbance. And um, it's found in very urban areas, found in suburban areas. And in fact, red admirals are more frequently seen in the city of Chicago than they are in some of the high quality prairies of the region. And it's this plant that is the reason for that. Uh, another um, butterfly species that makes a lot of use of lawn weeds is uh, this very beautiful butterfly, the buckeye. They will start showing up around midsummer. And they also have a number of um, caterpillar food plants, but the one that really keeps them going is uh, this particular lawn weed here, plantain. And so um, lawns that have a greater species diversity of plants in them are going to support a greater diversity of insects. And there are, there are other examples um, of plants that grow in lawns that will support other butterfly species as well. So you want to keep your approach simple, but you want to keep your yard complex. What I mean by that is you want to keep uh, a complexity of vegetative structure in your yard as possible. A combination of sun, of shade, of vegetation height, of vegetation density. Sometimes this involves a less tidy yard. The really highly manicured um, uh, landscaping tends to not be terribly insect friendly uh, and uh, definitely tends to be not butterfly friendly. Uh, one of the things that's often re recommended is to leave standing vegetation for the winter. There are a lot of insects that overwinter in the dead stems of standing vegetation. Uh, a number of really little uh, native solitary bees will do that. Uh, beetles will do that. Don't clean your yard up too early in the spring. Uh, a lot of people uh, suggest waiting until about the 1st of May, about now, uh, to clear out the standing vegetation. Um, this is my um, native um, uh, spring perennial garden here. And you'll notice I've left the leaf litter on it uh, over the winter. Um, that um, can be very important for a number of reasons. Uh, leaf litter tends to be home to lots of little critters like this, snails, slugs, roly polies. Um, and these are prey items for uh, a number of species of insects, most notably, uh, all of these little invertebrates that live down in the leaf litter are the prey base for the larvae of fireflies. And so if you've got a lot of those, you've really got the potential to have a lot more fireflies in your yard. Um, only the uh, larvae eat, eat these things. The adults um, may eat a little nectar and under certain circumstances, they will eat each other. Uh, but for the most part, adult fireflies don't feed. Uh, in general, lawn tends to be poor habitat for insects, and the more beautiful the lawn is, meaning the more it looks like a putting green, the less the habitat is going to be good for insects. Something else uh, about yards is that most likely there are more insects and more individuals insect diversity in your yard than you are aware of, because a lot of stuff is really, really little. Uh, I remember talking to somebody about bees recently, and most, most bee species, in particular native bee species, are really, really small, and they, they uh, 
uh, go about unnoticed. And um, honeybees are kind of the elephants of the bee world, and bumblebees are kind of the great blue whales of the bee world. So a lot of insect species are really small. Here is one example. Uh, this is a beautiful little beetle um, in the um, wood boring beetles family. Um, depending on the angle that you look at it from, it will either look dark blue or kind of purplish. And if you have uh, native woodland flowers in your yard, you may have this because this beetle is a specialist on the native geranium, geranium maculatum. And uh, this particular one was photographed in my yard. I've got a nice stand of the native geranium in my yard. I've never done anything to specifically uh, bring this beetle in. It's a case of if you build it, they will come. If you have um, wild geranium in your yard, there's a good chance that you are uh, obviously have this beetle. You should look for it just after the petals drop uh, from the flowers, and it will be sitting right on tops uh, on the tops of the geranium leaves. Um, the um, previous beetle was only about an eighth of an inch long. This insect is also only about an eighth of an inch long, but for such a tiny fly, this is a ferocious predator. Uh, this is actually one of the robber flies, and its common name is the gnat ogre. It's also about an eighth of an, eighth of an inch long, so its prey are tiny, tiny flies like gnats. You may have seen these because they're kind of, uh, brightly colored. These are long-legged flies. Um, they're very common in yards, depending on the angle of, that you're looking at them from, they may appear green or red. And these are also predators. These are going to prey on aphids. A lot of gardeners really like having long-legged flies in their garden because of the aphid control. And another exquisitely beautiful but tiny insect is the candy striped leafhopper. Um, I grow um, milkweeds in my yard for uh, monarchs, but there are a lot of insects that use milkweeds as host plants. And I'm a big believer in not making the milkweed being exclusively for monarch caterpillars. And there are longhorn beetles and all kinds of things on the milkweed. And this is a species that I always see on the milkweed in my yard every year. Uh, again, it's about an eighth of an inch long and brilliant red and um, uh, powder blue striping on the wings. Um, uh, really, really lovely insect that it is uh, easy to overlook because it's so tiny. Now, in addition to the big species, I want uh, the little species, I wanted to close out by um, talking about some of the larger species that people are sometimes afraid of. Um, this is a robber fly here. Uh, this is actually a much larger close relative of the gnat ogre that we saw a few minutes ago. Uh, a lot of people see this black part on the end here and think it's a stinger. These, in fact, do not sting. Um, most insects don't sting or bite. Um, this falls into the category, if you were to grab it and hold it in your hand, it would nip you to try to protect itself, but it's not going to fly at you and try to bite. The thing is, robber flies, and these range to over um, uh, a couple of inches long, some species are quite large, they're kind of buzzy, and that loud buzzing can alarm people sometimes, um, but they're really... Um, Unless you're a small flying insect, uh, which they eat avidly, they're really not going to be harmful to you. Uh, some of them are quite beautiful. Here's another species with bright metallic green eyes, uh, Permachus vertebratus. Um, they're, they're really, really cool insects. I used to be afraid of these when I, I was a little kid. I thought they were going to um, sting or bite me, but they, they do not do that. There are a bunch of things that mimic bees and wasps and adopt the bright, vivid, bold, um, usually yellow and black striping pattern of a lot of bees and wasps. And um, this uh, deters predation, but uh, these tend to be completely harmless to people. This is one I see both in my yard and on the grounds of the Nature Museum late in the year. This is uh, a locust boring longhorn beetle. 
Um, they're really beautiful and where you tend to see them is foraging on the flowers of goldenrods. And they're often foraging in the company of bees and they look kind of uh, uh, alarming and, and wasp-like at times, but in fact um, are completely harmless to people. We've been talking about bees and wasps and you know, a lot of people have had, including me, have had bad experiences with this group at getting stung. It's important to remember that bees and wasps are stinging you if they're defending their nests. And the more aggressive species are the social bees and wasps that are defending group resources and have a, a lot of resources that they're defending. Most species are solitary bees and wasps, and these are actually pretty docile. Many, many species actually don't have a stinger at all, but some of them can appear quite ferocious. And again, they, they will defend themselves if you attack them. But unlike the social wasps, you're much less likely to uh, accidentally encounter them by blundering into their nest and upsetting them. Uh, this is one of the scarier looking ones because it's huge. This is a cicada killer wasp. They're quite common in the area uh, and their prey are cicadas. And if you think about how big a cicada is, you know, a couple inches long, these need to be big enough to grab a cicada and carry it off. And so these are very, very large wasps. They, um, they look imposing, they look frightening, but I am not aware of anybody actually getting uh, stung by one with one exception, and that is uh, Justin Schmidt. He is a colleague of mine who has deliberately caused himself to be stung by various uh, stinging insects and developed a pain index out of it. But in terms of people just casually being out, most species of bees and wasps are not going to do, uh, do anything to you. Um, the other thing is this particular cicada killer is a male. It's, uh, the antenna shape tells you it's a male. Male bees and wasps do not sting at all. So the main thing that I'd like for people to take away from this this evening is to really enjoy the insects in your yard. There are probably more there than you think there are. There's a lot of species diversity, and um, it can be a lot of fun to watch them. So I will uh, end with that and stop. Thank you, Doug. Oh, I really appreciate that. That was, uh, I would like the breakdown of what you should think about when you're trying to attract insects. And uh, I saw a lot of things I haven't seen before. And um, so we will, now continue, um, I see that there are already some questions for you and we will continue with Mark, uh, who will talk about um, you know, how we're gonna think about mosquitoes in our yards while we're also thinking about other insect diversity. Thank you. Uh, I'm muted. There we go. How does that look? Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you for having me tonight. My name is Mark Clifton and I'm the executive director of the North Shore Mosquito Abatement District. Uh, Doug, that was an extremely interesting talk. I, I enjoyed that thoroughly. Thank you for doing that. Uh, tonight, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, it takes a village to control mosquitoes. It really does take uh, everyone's involvement to think about mosquitoes. It's not something that can only be done uh, through a kind of a centralized um, um, organization like a mosquito control district. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Okay, so I wanted to talk briefly about the North Shore Mosquito Abatement District. Uh, we were established in, in 1927 and we encompassed about 69 or 70 square miles and and 14 different communities in the North Shore area. Uh, we service about 330,000 people. Uh, most of our work is related to catch basin treatments. Uh, these are the stormwater catch basins that are throughout uh, Chicago and Evanston and Skokie and, and the whole North Shore area. And each one holds you know, hundreds of gallons of water pretty reliably. So we treat about 40,000 catch basins uh, three times a year. So about 120,000 treatments are occurring. Uh, over a summer season in the North Shore. We have about six square miles of forest preserves. Um, 
we manage about 30, over 3,000 off-road sites. Uh, in 2021, our budget was about $1.6 million, which uh, is about is less than $5 per resident in the district, so less than a, a can of DEET. Uh, we have seven full-time staff, including myself, uh, and then we hire between 14 and 16 seasonal staff uh, to help us manage the lab and also do uh, base uh, treatments during the season. Uh, the picture here is uh, from the Winneka Historical Society, and it shows some of the flooding that was uh, extremely common and kind of still is uh, in this area uh, before Skokie Lagoons and some of these uh, major projects um, were, were developed uh, to help drain the area. This is what uh, actually, I think the impetus behind forming the North Shore Mosquito Abatement District was the, the widespread standing water and mosquito problems that this region endured and actually still endures um, compared to other parts of the country. Um, so, whoops, okay. So these are some pictures that we have. We have a variety of pictures that are going on near hundred years old. And really the first mosquito control was, was dynamite and, and oil. Um, a lot of the canals and drainage that you see throughout the North Shore area was originally dug by the North Shore Mosquito Abatement District. So on the left is, is someone dynamiting. Uh, this is probably where the Edens is now. Um, maybe it's along Skokie Lagoons. And on the right is some of the first uh, attempts at mosquito control in the 1930s where they would use uh, oil, uh, you know, uh, motor oil or, or diesel oil. I mean, we've come a long way since then, but uh, this is what they would do to uh, suffocate mosquitoes, larval mosquitoes that were uh, in the water. Uh, these are some of the maps from some, uh, some of our original annual reports showing uh, larval habitat in, in 1931 in the North Shore area. You can see there was no Chicago Botanical Gardens. There was no Skokie Lagoons. Uh, there was just the North Branch, the Chicago River, and every dot represented a place uh, where mosquitoes um, were breeding and that they would um, oil or somehow drain to prevent that from happening. On the right is um, uh, the, showing this, this is amazing. This is a hand-drawn figure. Somebody sat and there was no Excel and drew this, this figure uh, showing the, uh, you know, abundance of 80s vexens, which is a, a really notorious biter of humans uh, during the summer. This mosquito peaked that year and about 4th of July. So there was a lot of ruined picnics uh, because that's what that mosquito likes to do. Uh, so now our mission is really to manage local mosquito populations with the aim of reducing the risk of disease from mosquito-borne uh, viruses. Uh, and then our secondary mission is to minimize the negative impact mosquitoes have on, on the quality of life. Uh, unchecked mosquitoes can um, uh, be a significant impact on the quality of life and really prevent people from using the outdoors or using the forest preserves or using any of the great uh, outdoor spaces that we have. So um, some of the mosquito-borne viruses that we have in the Midwest, uh, by far and away the most uh, common is West Nile virus. Uh, last year, we had um, eight cases in the district of neuroinvasive West Nile. Uh, people de died last year. Uh, that's pretty common every year. The whole state of Illinois had about 154 cases. That's also a pretty common year. Uh, Cook County has the third highest incidence of West Nile virus uh, in the country. Uh, we're considered a hot spot for it by the CDC and the North Shore area in specific is a hot spot um, for, for various reasons, um, probably mostly related to underground infrastructure, combined sewer, stormwater infrastructure throughout Evanston, Skokie, and probably parts of Wilmette, and, and a variety of other reasons. Uh, we have other viruses that uh, have appeared or could appear, St. Louis encephalitis um, was kind of displaced by West Nile, but it still exists. Uh, lacrosse encephalitis is more common in Wisconsin, but occasionally cases do occur in Illinois. Same with Jamestown Canyon, which has actually been increasing over the last four or five years throughout the Midwest. Eastern equine encephalitis, uh, encephalomyelitis is uh, much more common in uh, Michigan and Indiana, um, but that's something that we're always on the lookout for, and uh, also Western equine encephalitis. So these are all things that exist in the Midwest and under the right conditions uh, could reappear. But every year we do see West Nile virus. Uh, all viruses uh, that we're talking about and really specifically West Nile are animal viruses. Uh, West Nile is a bird virus that's spread between Culex mosquitoes and birds. 
in this zoonotic uh, cycle. Occasionally, uh, a Culex mosquito uh, will bite a human. About 10% of them decide that they would prefer humans over birds. Uh, and that mosquito would, would then be a vector because it's vectoring that virus into a human population or uh, occasionally into animals. So our strategy really relies on reducing the number of vector mosquitoes and that will reduce the odds that an infected one bites a, a person. That's the, the center of the public health mission is just reducing this, this Culex mosquito population uh, wherever we can. Uh, to do that, we use what's called integrated vector management. Uh, a lot of people think of mosquito abatement or mosquito control and think that the control part is the biggest part of what we do. And it's actually not, it's just one piece of an integrated method uh, to uh, control uh, mosquitoes. The uh, biggest part of what we do is vector surveillance. We monitor populations of vector mosquitoes and we also monitor the uh, prevalence of viruses in those mosquitoes or other uh, diseases if they could appear. Uh, that forms uh, the center of, of, well, not the center, but a, a, big piece of, a big piece of our management program. Um, we also maintain a public outreach and education uh, component to teach people about mosquitoes, to teach people about precautions, to do the kinds of things that, I, that I'm doing tonight, uh, communicating about mosquitoes. Uh, we also have a, a quality control and research component where we're constantly assessing the work that we do to make sure that it's safe, that it's effective, that it's not affecting non-target uh, species, uh, that everything's working the way uh, that it should. Uh, we also research new methods um, <clears throat> that can um, help protect the public health or, or you know, make summers uh, more enjoyable without disrupting uh, other things. And underneath all of this is uh, a, a ton of data. The whole operation is data driven. Uh, we use uh, information to decide everything. Nothing is done on a schedule or just because someone feels like it. Um, at the bottom is vector control methods, and these are the actual uh, things that we could do to reduce mosquito populations. And I wanted to expand that uh, because really uh, physical, biological, and chemical control fit into a pyramid. And this is the strategy that we employ uh, to control mosquitoes. Um, it's fit into a pyramid because you do the most uh, uh, things at the base of the pyramid and then you do the least amount of things at the top of the pyramid. And so most of our effort is focused at preventing mosquitoes or uh, denying them habitat or preventing people from getting sick. That can move to physical methods of preventing mosquitoes, uh, uh, you know, draining things. Um, we can move to biological controls. Most of the uh, methods we use involve BTI or Bacillus spiricus, which are highly specific. The strains we use are highly specific for mosquitoes. Uh, and then we do have the ability to do, use chemical uh, control uh, if everything else that we have tried has failed to um, correct a public health issue or humans are in imminent risk of being infected by West Nile. And we know that by monitoring the progression of West Nile during a season, uh, we have a pretty good idea of when, when human beings are likely to get sick. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and then now talk about some of the things that uh, people can do. So urban greening has been, as you're all aware, I'm sure a, a big movement over the last maybe 10 or 15 years of uh, taking urban spaces and, and making them greener. And this is a wonderful thing for human health and for uh, resiliency and biodiversity. Um, but like all insects, um, mosquitoes uh, like uh, a, a diverse um, yard as well. Uh, they use plants for harborage, they use nectar for food. And so um, in studies that have looked, they find that when you have more vegetative biomass and biodiversity, it will uh, harbor, you have a higher abundance uh, of mosquitoes in those areas. I also sh am showing this paper because it's interesting. Uh, this paper found that mowing uh, didn't make a difference. You can mow, you can not mow. It doesn't affect the abundance of mosquitoes. So I know uh, there's always been this argument uh, that people should mow because you know uh, tall grass harbors mosquitoes. Well, in this uh, in Columbus, Ohio, that wasn't found to be the case. Tall grass uh, didn't create more mosquitoes, but a uh, higher uh, uh, plant diversity did, and that's okay. It just means we have to pay attention uh, to the things around uh, our homes that can uh, cause uh, mosquitoes to reproduce or uh, a habitat for them to reproduce. 
Um, so uh, a lot of people think that there's only one kind of mosquito. They don't realize that there's 40 or 50 different species probably in Illinois. We have a very high diversity of mosquitoes, uh, a range of uh, different species that are invasive, uh, ones that are generally more southerly but occur here. And then we also have species that are more northerly that occur here. So we have kind of a, an overlap zone with just a, a wide variety of mosquitoes. Uh, Aedes japonicus is uh, the Asian bush mosquito. It is, as you can imagine, an invasive species that um, is probably the third most abundant mosquito species that we find now. Loves containers, things around the home. Uh, Culex pipiens and Culex restuans are very difficult to tell apart under a microscope. They're very similar. Both of them are the vector of West Nile. Um, Culex restuans is our native version and Culex pipiens is also an invasive mosquito um, that came from Europe probably in the 1600s and is completely uh, global at this point. Aedes vexens is our, uh, as the name uh, says, vexens. It is a vexing mosquito. It is highly abundant and uses uh, flood water um, so if you're um, at a, a park in June after the rain, maybe five days after the rain, and there's a ton of mosquitoes, it's probably Aedes vexens or its friend there, Aedes trivitatus. Both of those will use uh, standing water uh, on the ground. Uh, there's Aedes triceriatus. This is the tree hole mosquito, really prefers things like tree holes, and is also the vector of lacrosse and cephalitis. Um, <clears throat> we have Anopheles quadrimaculatus, and there's a variety of other Anopheles mosquitoes as well. This was the former vector of malaria. Malaria has been mostly eradicated in the United States, actually completely eradicated. So uh, it's not a vector anymore, uh, but it once was the scourge of, of Illinois. A lot of people had malaria uh, in the past before the CDC was invented and uh, made it a mission to eradicate malaria uh, from uh, the continental United States. Um, so we have a couple other uh, more southerly species that have been tending to show up more and more and that's Seraphora ferox. These are really large mosquitoes. It's kind of neat because it's got purple on its legs and you can't see it's uh, the longest legs here but they have like little white booties. Uh, this is a big mosquito and the biggest is this Seraphora uh, howardii um, which is often called a galley nipper. Um, it's a really big mosquito and we see these occasionally. When they land on you, you'll, you'll know it. Um, but I wanted to give you an idea of the diversity and range uh, of mosquitoes that, that we do have uh, in, in this area. And there are many more. Uh, just briefly, uh, there's two things that mosquitoes really need to live. They have to have water. Uh, they are uh, go through an aquatic development. They're kind of like a, a butterfly in some ways because they'll, uh, just like a caterpillar will turn into a chrysalis and eventually turn into an adult flying uh, butterfly. Uh, a mosquito um, larvae is, is kind of like a caterpillar uh, and will go through its uh, four instars, eventually uh, pupate instead of a chrysalis, so we just call it a pupa, and then it will turn into an adult mosquito that will emerge at the surface of the water. Uh, mosquitoes in general have to have blood to complete this cycle. And they also have to have water. There are no terrestrial larval mosquitoes. Uh, so the key to mosquito control has always been denying them uh, water or denying them blood. Those are the two main places where, they're, uh, where they are the weakest. <clears throat> so I wanted to go through some of the sources of water that you may find or you may have around your home. Many of these pictures are from the area. Um, uh, things that we've seen over time. And I'm gonna kind of go through uh, the particulars of some of these. So uh, first we have tree holes. Uh, a tree hole fills up with water and can produce a tremendous amount of mosquitoes over a season. And I'll show you just how many mosquitoes can be produced from a small amount of standing water. This is a potential public health risk because it, it is the home of Aedes triceriatus and a variety of other species that will occasionally use tree holes. And the best way to, to prevent this is to fill it. Um, uh, expanding foam can be used. The CDC doesn't recommend uh, using sand or, um, or gravel. I think if it's a low tree hole, probably sand would be okay. Um, but expanding foam would work as well. And there are expanding foams that are dark colored so they don't stand out. But the idea here is prevention. We're trying to prevent uh, the mosquito from being able to access that habitat. We're trying to prevent water from collecting there. 
Um, and that will work better than any sort of treatment ever could work. Um, you can also contact us um, and we can uh, assess the situation uh, and maybe even fill the hole for you if you have one of these. <clears throat> Um, uh, there's a, a variety of household containers that people forget about that hold water. I, and since this is a gardening group, wheelbarrows, uh, um, you know, watering cans, um, buckets that are left out, children's toys are frequently uh, a source of standing water. And if they're out there for more than five days, you're at risk of the mosquito, larval mosquitoes completing their life cycle. Um, it needs, these things need to be dumped and drained every, every few days, really no more than five or six days. And there's a variety of mosquitoes that can be produced in containers. And I put some of them there on the right. And these mosquitoes are all vectors of various different uh, viruses. So there is a risk from having these kinds of containers around that are, that are making mosquitoes. If you can't prevent it or you can't drain it, there is treatments that you can use uh, that have BTI or maybe a mosquito hormone. Uh, we prefer prevention and then denying them water, um, but there is treatment. Sometimes there's things that just can't be dumped out for various reasons. And so there is things that we can do to, to kill mosquito larvae uh, that are highly specific for mosquitoes. And if there's nothing else you can do or it's not your property, you can report it to us and, and we can deal with it. Uh, that's really what we're for. Um, so that's always an option as well. So I wanted to illustrate how, how many mosquitoes a container, um, or like in this case, a kiddie pool can make. Um, this is a picture of egg rafts. Culex pipians mosquitoes lay rafts at the surface of the water. Um, there's 65 egg rafts uh, in this picture. Uh, the average egg raft contains between maybe 100 and 300 eggs. And the bottom right is a close-up of an egg raft showing all the individual eggs. So this pool, just what's in this picture, will create between 6,500 and 19,500 mosquitoes within the next seven days after this picture was taken. Uh, both Culex pipians and Culex restuans lay egg rafts like this. Um, by late August, uh, we generally have about 4% of our mosquitoes, our Culex mosquitoes are infected with West Nile. That's about 40 out of 1,000. So right here in this picture, you're looking at between 260 and 780 uh, mosquitoes infected with West Nile during the peak of West Nile in late August in your yard from just, just this picture here. So you can imagine how a handful of small sources of water can really create a public health risk of West Nile. And again, the most important thing for us is preventing this, preventing this from happening is the, is the best possible thing that we can do. Um, now you can just imagine what an abandoned pool would do, uh, how many egg rafts there must be in here and the amount of mosquitoes created from something like this. Um, so the best strategy with something like a pool is to maintain it. But if you can't do that, again, you can report it to us, um, it, whether it's on your property or not, doesn't matter. Uh, we'll treat it and make sure that it doesn't uh, produce mosquitoes during the season. <clears throat> and pools are a, a big source of Culex pipians, which is, you know, also a vector of dog heartworms. So it's their animal health uh, issues as well. Uh, discarded objects are a big one. We have random toilets sometimes out there that we find, um, sometimes just yards that have lots of stuff. And in general, lots of stuff left outside collects water and creates a, a lot of mosquitoes. So Again, the best strategy here is to prevent, to dump, and if you can't uh, do that, then to treat regularly. This is really hard to treat because it's a really intricate pile of debris. Uh, and so I would recommend reporting it to us. We can work with uh, a local health department or zoning to have this kind of stuff cleaned up. We have methods to treat it with BTI in, in the interim to prevent it from making mosquitoes. Um, but this is something that, you know, if it's around your property, if it's not on your property, we, we can deal with this. <clears throat> Here's one that gets me every spring is clogged gutters and other sorts of household drainage. These are notorious in our area for producing mosquitoes. Uh, gutters uh, are, are just like this uh, arboreal water source and Culex restaurants just absolutely loves them. Uh, you, you, they, will, they will fill them with egg rafts in the spring. So uh, it's really important to clean gutters because these are highly productive sources of mosquito habitat. And then those corrugated drainage pipes that everyone's seen, if they're not really designed properly to convey that water away, 
uh, they'll hold water inside. And these are another notorious source of mosquitoes that you might overlook. It doesn't take much, much water to generate a real problem. And those corrugated drainage pipes tend to do that a lot. Uh, uh, very common in the North Shore are backyard catch basins. These are um, you know, stormwater conveyance that's built in the backyards between rows of houses. Skokie has a lot of these, Evanston does as well. If you have one of these, you can report it to us. We maintain maps of everyone that we know about. And we have thousands that we know about that we will treat regularly to make sure that they don't produce mosquitoes. Many of these will hold hundreds of gallons of water. Uh, they get overgrown frequently with um, yard clippings and, and plants. Uh, and so um, you can report these to us and we, we will take care of them. Discarded tires, you can report these to us. In this last year, um, we uh, started a collection program uh, for discarded tires. Again, these are perfect mosquito habitat. You couldn't, if you wanted to make, design a mosquito habitat, you could not have designed uh, something better than a tire. They're just dark, water stays there all the time. They accumulate uh, organic detritus, which is important uh, for the mosquitoes, for the microbial community that the mosquitoes feed on. Um, but we'll collect up to four of them. So you can report these uh, on our website. That's the best thing to do rather than just deal with them. These are a big problem. Rain barrels, everyone loves them, but if they're not maintained, they make a huge, they make a huge problem as well. Um, there's really four things to watch out for with, with rain barrels. Uh, the first is to make sure that the, the downspout is separated from the opening to the rain barrel and that the, the opening to the rain barrel has a, a double layer of screen. Uh, sometimes people will try and put the downspout into the rain barrel and then try and seal it. But the smallest gap will allow uh, mosquitoes in and out and they will use that standing water to reproduce. Sometimes the decorative tops may have rims that hold water. And so you wanna make sure that, that that's, um, you know, you don't have water sitting on top of the rain barrel. Um, sometimes they have overflow ports. You wanna make sure those are sealed with screen so that, because um, mosquitoes will go right inside that uh, overflow port to, to use that habitat. And then sometimes water will remain below the, the outflow valve. So even when you think the water's gone, there will still be water in that barrel. So when these became popular, they became a significant problem in our area uh, because they, they tend to not be well-maintained uh, and they can produce, as you've seen, just a, an immense amount of mosquitoes. Tarps, tarps are one of my uh, least favorite, uh, you know, these, uh, these are pictures from around the district. They're really hard to treat because they have just hundreds of little pockets of water, so, you know, buried deep inside the tarp that will produce mosquitoes. So these just really need to be maintained and checked regularly. There's really no good way of treating these. I mean, we can try, but um, they preventing this from occurring is the best. On the left is a boat that's holding hundreds of gallons of water. I mean, that's just a, a, an immense problem for mosquitoes. Uh, on the right, you can see there's all kinds of folded little pockets that are holding water. So all of this is mosquito habitat. Um, this is very common in our area. This is just flooded water, uh, flooded yards, puddles, groundwater. You'll see this uh, all over. Um, this is best reported to us as standing water. And the bottom right is a depression in someone's yard that was just making mosquitoes. Um, and we can do things to prevent mosquitoes from emerging. The top right is an interesting picture. You'll see there's a dark band along uh, the shore here. And that is actually uh, uh, 80s Vexens, pupae and fourth instars that you know, are near emergence. Thousands upon thousands of them in a synchronous brood uh, about ready to emerge. So it's not a snake or anything else. That's all mosquitoes. And that's really common in some of these fields and parks and stuff that we have. Uh, catch basins. Again, this is a picture inside of a catch basin showing you the, the couple of hundred gallons that they're holding with all the organic debris. Culex pipians just loves this kind of uh, organic rich habitat. Uh, these are best reported to us. We have a place on our website uh, to report these things as service requests. So if you have one in your backyard or you're unsure about one, maybe on your street, we have almost every single one in the district mapped, but uh, it doesn't hurt to check. Uh, we'll make sure that they're uh, in our maps. <clears throat> so I briefly wanted to um, uh, talk about denying mosquitoes blood. And this is, I just wanted to show this video real quick because this is a mosquito uh, feeding um, on a mouse at the microscopic level. So when you see a mosquito um, feeding, that's the end of its proboscis. 
that's what it's doing as it's probing uh, up and down in your skin. It's actually that proboscis is searching uh, for um, a vein or a capillary uh, to uh, engage and then to drink the blood. It's, I don't know, I just thought I would show it because it's one of the most interesting videos about um, mosquito biology that, that I know about. And there it just drains the capillary completely. So as I mentioned, uh, mosquitoes require uh, blood uh, for egg production. Without blood, they're not gonna produce very many eggs. And so um, there's some really important things that you can do to prevent mosquitoes from using your blood. Uh, there's more to repellents than DEET. Uh, I hear all the time people don't wanna use repellents because they don't like DEET. It's kind of uh, greasy, it smells bad. Uh, but wearing a repellent is the single most important uh, intervention that can be done to prevent a mosquito-borne disease. It's more effective than anything mosquito abatement can do. And, and I'm not just saying that, uh, you know, qualitatively, I, it, it's quantitative as well. This is uh, underpins all the strategy for malaria prevention in Africa is preventing mosquitoes from actually biting humans. Uh, on our website and on the EPA's website, there's a tool that you can use to find out um, all the different, uh, different brands of repellents uh, that are potentially available for mosquitoes and ticks or mosquitoes or ticks. And there's a variety of, of new entrants into this repellent market, uh, more than just DEET. Um, there's two undecanone, which is uh, uh, a chemical that's found in banana, cloves, ginger, guava. It repels mosquitoes, catnip oil, uh, your cat will, will love you. Um, there's citronella and citronella oil, which as a repellent can be effective uh, as a personal repellent. IR3535, oil of lemon eucalyptus, uh, picaridin, which is one that I like. It works as well as D and doesn't have any of the greasiness or smell. Um, but this tool can tell you um, the actual name brand uh, but the key is that you use something that's EPA approved um, because uh, the, the manufacturers have to demonstrate that it's effective, uh, how long it works, um, and that it's safe. And so EPA repellents are, you know, um, EPA approval is key for that. <clears throat> There's a variety of things that don't work uh, that everyone does. Citronella candles. Um, this is a, a paper that found, at least with Aedes aegypti, not a mosquito we have here, but uh, it attracted slightly more mosquitoes with a citronella candle uh, than without. It wasn't a significant result, but still, uh, citronella candles just uh, don't really work well. Personal repellent uh, bands um, don't really work well unless they've been EPA approved. So there's a lot of repellent products out there that are just uh, not effective. Um, there's products out there that work with mixed results. You may have seen a mosquito magnet. This thing burns propane to attract mosquitoes and trap them or the Dynatrap, uh, these are sold on Amazon and, and throughout. And, you know, in most cases, people have not been able to measure a decline in the mosquito population using these. And when you think about it, you're kind of attracting mosquitoes, you know, to your yard. If you use something that's emitting CO2, mosquitoes are kind of like sharks. They follow the plume of CO2 upwind to find the host. And so if you're putting out a bunch of CO2, you're gonna attract mosquitoes. I think there was one paper where um, there was a reduction in biting pressure with the mosquito magnet. So there's mixed, mixed results if this is really going to, to help or not. Um, there's products that don't work at all and you know they're just complete, I, I have no idea why they're even sold. Uh, the Spartan mosquito eradicator, this is based on salt. Um, they sell these all over. Um, there's no basis to think that salt uh, will kill larval uh, mosquitoes or adult mosquitoes. Um, well, enough salt will kill a larval mosquito, but there's no reason to think that salt will kill an adult mosquito. They feed on blood and blood is loaded with iron and salts. And if there's anything a mosquito is good at, it's dealing with salts um, uh, and uh, you know, things like that. So th if you see these, these are, these are not, these are not gonna be effective. <clears throat> now there are some products that do work if you want kind of a repellent effect, uh, say you're gonna be outside, uh, thermocells are something that has been shown to work. Uh, and these are sold on Amazon as well. They're not very expensive. Um, they use a pyrethroid to repel, not to kill. Um, uh, pyrethroids have a, a, a really strong repellent effect for mosquitoes. 
Um, but it's not being applied to any surfaces. It's not being sprayed. It's not being applied to mosquitoes. Um, so you'll have to make a choice if that's something you would want to do, but they are highly effective at repelling mosquitoes in almost every study that has looked at them. And they have everything from personal ones to, you know, ones that can go on a patio that look like a lantern. So that's always an option. Um, there's a handful of other approaches. Uh, the old box fan approach, uh, mosquitoes are not the strongest flyers. So creating some current to blow them away will work. Um, so that's an option of just avoiding dawn and dusk. The, the mosquitoes we have here are definitely active <laughs> most at dawn and dusk uh, where they're seeking a host. And so avoiding those times is an option. Uh, ensuring tight fitting screens. Many of the mosquitoes we have will enter the home to take a blood meal. Uh, and so ensuring that you have screens that are, that are fitted tightly is, is key to preventing mosquito bites inside your home. And then loose fitting clothing that's light colored, long sleeves and long pants. Those are just uh, really common old standby uh, tactics for um, preventing mosquitoes from biting through your clothing, uh, prevent them from being attracted in the first place. They're not terribly attracted to light clothing and then protecting your ankles or your wrists from mosquitoes. Uh, things that we really don't recommend are mosquito, mosquito barrier treatments. Uh, we don't really do these. We don't really recommend these. Um, again, if you look at our pyramid of interventions, these skip right to the top. Uh, they go right to the top of the pyramid before anything else has been tried or attempted. They're not done with data frequently or any sort of evidence that there's a mosquito problem that's significant enough to warrant this. Um, basically, this is a material that's applied to foliage and the mosquitoes and other insects uh, land on that foliage and, and they're killed. Uh, we have a major problem with mosquito resistance to pyrethroids in Illinois. Um, we've have found this over the last five years in our district and um, the Illinois Natural History Survey has found this throughout the state of Illinois. Uh, the more of these materials that are applied, the more it um, exacerbates or supports the maintenance of resistance in the population and the less um, able we are to intervene in a real public health emergency uh, with materials that, that we may have on a, you know, on a community-wide basis. So these, these, in my opinion, these are kind of a, they're kind of a public health risk at this point with resistance being as widespread as it is. They don't do anything to, to help uh, us. All the other methods, if people practice them, would do a lot more, I think. <clears throat> You can submit a service request to us on our website. Uh, we have a place right at the top, service request. You can go to nsmad.org or .com. You can call us, you can call me, I'll put it in. Uh, we also below service requests have a place called real-time treatment activity. You can see every treatment that we see. You can see nearly all of our data uh, that we can share that's not, you know, private addresses and stuff. You, so if you're wondering what have we done, what were we doing in the park across the street or did we treat that catch basin in front of your house? Uh, you can go here and you can see that information. So I wanted to uh, point that out, that's new. All of our uh, data is available, it's transparent. You can access everything we can see. Uh, and with that, I wanted to thank you for having me tonight. I'm sure there's a lot of questions and I, I hope that that was helpful as you think about uh, um, creating, you know, biodiverse uh, spaces in your yards. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. And I, I yeah, there's a lot of very useful information in there. And I think, uh, you know, we can kind of start to see uh, an intersection here where you can have uh, a biodiverse yard and, and you can still uh, it, manage your mosquito risk. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Maria Dabrowski, who will uh, facilitate our Q&A. And Maria, are you ready? I am very ready. There are a lot of great questions, so I will get us started. I'll try and go in between and do one for, for Doug and one for Mark, but we'll see how that goes. Um, okay. So we have a question here about, from Karen for Doug. Um, can you talk about the relative value of native plants versus cultivars as insect habitat and food sources? Yeah, thank you. That, that is a great question because a lot of cultivars are not actually terribly 
good. Let's use purple cone flower as an example. Excellent nectar resource for insects, but recently there have been wild colors and wild flower forms and that sort of thing. And it seems to be the case that the further you get from that pink daisy looking um, wild type um, purple cone flower, the less it functions as a good nectar source. In general, double flowers are particularly poor nectar sources. Many double flowers don't produce nectar at all. Okay, okay. So when possible native plants, cultivars stray away from being beneficial. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that answer. Okay, Mark, this one's for you. Does a, we have a few questions as I'm perusing, we have a few questions about bird baths. And so this question is, does a bubbling water in motion bird bath harbor mosquito larvae? It can, yeah, it definitely can. Uh, we've seen, you know, things like ornamental ponds or bird baths that are moving still have quiet areas that'll harbor mosquitoes. Um, you know, uh, most of the time, keeping them moving, keeping them from being stagnant will work. You got to check on them. If you just have the simple bird bath with water that sits there, as long as they're emptied and refilled every few days, they're fine. Okay. Uh, that, that will work. Um, there's other approaches to with, you know, like treating with Bacillus sphericus or uh, BTI that you could also do. But just refilling is the easiest thing, you know, draining it and refilling it. That's not too, that's not too challenging. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay, Doug. Someone asked that they have, or someone said they have mainly native plants and they leave their leaves, et cetera, over winter. And they're asking about when can they do a little cleanup in the garden and not harm insects that are hibernating or nesting, et cetera, in the springtime? Oh, I think you're muted. There we go. Um, uh, the answer to that, of course, varies with where you are. And so for the Chicago area, generally about now is when you can start going in and, and taking leaves out, late April, early May. And how do you think that will change with climate change in the coming years? It'll get earlier. Okay. But for now? For now, that's 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 my story and I'm sticking to it for now. Okay. That sounds good. Um, all right, let's see here for Mark. We have a question. How does the spraying of NSMAD impact pollinators and other insects? Well, we, we really don't do very much in the way of spraying. Um, most of our treatments are, are focused on catch basins or on uh, uh, targeted treatments with BTI or BS and you know, flood water. I think we've done one night of spraying two years ago. And that's, I mean, on average, most communities get zero. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, you know, we could if we had to, and we have the ability to, but that's why we monitor uh, for West Nile. Um, and we have, and we also have resistance. So uh, doing a lot of spraying won't, won't help in any of that. So yeah. uh, we've invested a lot in uh, technology to be able to track and monitor um, places where mosquitoes are being produced and, and just treat them regularly with, with things that are just highly specific for mosquitoes. Like, you know, BTI pretty much just kills mosquitoes. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah, targeted is definitely the way to go. Mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you for that. Doug, so related to the previous question, there is a movement called No Mow May, where you don't mow in the month of May. Someone is asking how important is the concept of No Mow May, especially if you can start kind of tidying up in late April. And do you think that it should be promoted universally or at least where you have these the seasons that we have here? Yeah, I think the seasons that we have here is an important aspect of that because um, uh, as you go uh, down into like Kentucky and that area, it's right. probably more like no more April that you're going to want. Right. But um, in, in particular, um, um, the dandelions are a real important uh, nectar source for a lot mm -hmm. of early season stuff. And um, that's, that's uh, a big part of it. And so yeah. I, I am a fan of no more May. Awesome. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. All right, Mark, for you, this is a, uh, there's a bit of background to this question. I'm going to summarize it as pollution, especially plastic pollution, can harbor standing water. And so 
have the, the question here is, I think, what can be done to eliminate this? Because obviously reporting to your team, your team can't go and clean up every area in the in you know the whole North Shore. But have, I guess, the question to build off of this is, have you and your team considered working with any sort of litter reduction cleanup programs? Because obviously all the trash that's just sitting there collects water and, and all that. Is that something that you all would consider doing or do you have any ideas about that? You know, we just started with the tire collection mm -hmm. um, component and, and I, I consider litter to be, you know, it's a source reduction. Mm -hmm. The way it's set up now, um, you know, litter and yards is a zoning and code issued. So they, they have, you know, the municipalities have the enforcement mechanisms to ensure that that's cleaned up. Uh, we don't haven't been involved in, in roadside litter or anything like that. You know, it's not a probably not a huge problem for us because those mm -hmm. are really small, you know, small containers that don't hold water for long. Litter piles and piles of junk are are a problem, uh, but we will work with municipalities to have those cleaned up when when we know about them. So, um, so <laughs> I know that's not like the strongest answer. Um, but you know, source reduction is an important priority for us, uh, yeah. and so um, you know, moving forward, that that is something we'll have to look at. Um, and yeah. in this world where we have resistance, like we do, that's our option. That's our only option, really. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. It's a, a huge task knowing that there are some places that just have an exorbitant amount of of litter to try and tackle. All right, Doug, um, from a global conservation perspective, can you speak to the relative importance of the common species we're likely to help in our suburban yards versus the rare slash conser conservative species that are restricted to high quality natural areas? Yeah, we, we know the most about the big showy groups, dragonflies, butterflies, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that they're a good model for things, a majority of the species seem to be adaptable to the broader landscape. Okay. Um, the, the number of uh, the species that are um, restricted to these high quality natural areas uh, disproportionately represent uh, uh, threatened endangered species, that sort of thing. But I think this does speak to the importance for uh, conservation of these uh, species that are adaptive to um, human disturbance. That's going to be the group that is more likely to be carrying most of the um, biodiversity of this group into the future. Right, no, that certainly makes sense. Thank you for that. This question, I'll start with Mark, but I will change it to also apply to what you're talking about, Doug. So this, this question is for you, Mark, how would you approach or present neighbors or present to neighbors or whoever looks at the approaches that you all do versus using chemicals and sprays and commercial foggers in the front and backyard? So how would you recommend that the average person communicate with neighbors, loved ones, friends, family about using your sorts of approaches versus the the more commercial more damaging ones yeah that is incredibly difficult and i think a big part of the bill that we worked on hb 3118 was that applicators would put notifications you know in on yards just like you would do for a turf grass treatment so that people would see that there's you know this is important enough to merit you know some sort of signage and then hope that that might spur the conversation. Um, but it, it is a really hard thing to approach um, someone, you know, a neighbor about what they're doing on their on their property. Um, but I would suggest that if there is a mosquito problem in the area, you can contact us and tell us and say that there's biting mosquitoes and we can come out there. And often um, we're very, um, tactful and diplomatic, um, but often people are making their own mosquito problem and then paying someone to come and, mm -hmm. and do a treatment. And so we can, if we go to one house, we can often go to lots of different houses in the neighborhood. We do that all the time. We're very good at it. And um, that's one strategy is to um, have us take a look and see if there's something we don't know about um, or if there's a, a issue um, that no one knows about. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And do you want to give like a 
20 second summary of the bill that you just mentioned. Uh, yeah, HB 3118, it was the pollinator protection uh, bill that would um, uh, add some new requirements for barrier treatments, the kind of treatments that go on a perimeter of a yard that are long lasting. Super cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, and then to adapt the question for you, Doug, when if somebody has a neighbor who has this beautiful yard that's beautifully manicured, like you were talking about, big problems there, how, how would you suggest a person might be able to bring these up, family, friends, loved ones, that native plants are so critical and, and can make a yard beautiful as well, but also have benefits for insects? I think part of it is is sort of a leading by example thing and um, making your your yard beautiful and good for insects. Um, this, um, although it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem as it was um, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, I think um, uh, a lot of people who are managing their yards for her habitat would have sort of the opposite of, of, of that happen. Not so much that you're going to say to your neighbor, you're not doing something right, but your neighbor's saying, you know, your yard looks really messy. And I think that um, uh, certainly as this has become um, more widespread and more understood as uh, an approach to landscaping, people have gotten used to the look, people have come to appreciate the look, people have come to appreciate the value. Certainly in the time that the Nature Museum has been open, where we do our, our um, native groundscaping, um, we have found that it is much more widely embraced than it was when the museum was first open, when a lot of people would simply say, oh, it's all just weeds, what are you doing there? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm happy to hear that. We'll have one more question for Mark, and then I will turn it back over to Catherine. So Mark, you had mentioned the importance of repellents. And so Lisa asks, ha, uh, do repellents have a shelf life? And once they've reached the end of their shelf life, if they have one, how, what would you recommend as a safe way to discard old repellents? Well, I, I don't know that any of the repellents have specific recommendations for discarding them. And I believe the container being recycled is the only recommendation. Um, there's a variety of different repellents. Uh, and so I, it would be hard to give one general recommendation about the, the lifespan, but you know, DEET will last some time. Uh, I think the big issue is propellant in the can is what won't last. <laughs> so um, it's gonna be really dependent, um, but you know, using that tool on the EPA's website, or we have it also on ours, um, you can make choices about the right repellent and then determine those features if there's anything specific, but there shouldn't be anything specific for repellents. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Doug and Mark, thank you both so much. I, we have so many more questions, but we're out of time to ask them. So thank you both for your answers. And I'm going to turn it back over to Catherine. Thanks. Thanks very much. Say, so, Doug, I do want to ask one really quick question before we end, and that is, um, with respect to the water that bugs need, insects need um, in your yard, could uh, it, dragonflies and things like that uh, be able to use moving water? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to sort of reconcile the no standing water with the need for water by certain species. Yeah, uh, how tolerant um, um, dragonfly naiads and damselfly naiads are to um, current varies a lot with species. Um, I have tended not to talk about gardening in your yard for dragonflies very much simply because of all of the problems with standing water in yards. And, um, uh, you know, I think that. Uh, um, the broader interest would be better served by doing other types of habitat management than, than things that might uh, contribute to mosquito problems. Mark yeah. probably likes that answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, right. I mean, we're, we're reaching, we're trying to reach a compromise right here. And so, well, okay. So yeah, that's, that's a very uh, politic and yeah, um, practical answer. So Thank you both so much for taking the time. I uh, appreciate this very much. And there was a, a lot of really great information. We will um, 
be sending out an email to all participants uh, the, uh, after the uh, webinar tonight, and they will include that email will include some resources that the speakers have provided um, for you to access as well, um, some websites and some recommendations for insect guides. Uh, so you can take advantage of those as well. Uh, and remember to look up our uh, other uh, upcoming and uh, recorded webinars on our Going Green Matters website. Uh, thank you both so much again, and thanks to everyone for participating. Have a great evening uh, and, uh, you know, rethink your yard or continue to think about your yard. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.